We're getting some pretty advanced new technology from this war. Radar, nuclear reactors, penicillin. Those are some of the big things scientists are working on right now. But we're also seeing the development of ordinary things as well. And it won't be long before every home has a little bit of World War II technology inside of it. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a World War II special looking at some of the inventions created by the war. Most of these are already in development before the war, actually, but they've been refined and mass-produced in answer to the needs of the conflict. I'm going to start off with, with something that never fails and which gives its operator potent new capabilities. It is duct tape. Yeah, duct tape. People have already been using strips of cloth treated in oil as a waterproofing tape, though. As far back as 1902, the cables on the Williamsburg Suspension Bridge in New York were protected in this way. And in 1930, Popular Mechanics Magazine described a method for creating a similar adhesive waterproof cotton tape at home. These cloths were referred to as duck wrapping, duck being an old-fashioned word derived from the Dutch duk, meaning cloth. So, by the outbreak of the war, it already sort of exists, but it would not become a mass-produced product without the work of one woman. Vesta Stout is a 52-year-old mother working at the Green River Ordnance Plant in Dixon, Illinois. Here, she inspects and packs ammunition boxes containing rifle grenades. The boxes are waxed to waterproof them, and they have a thin paper tab left loose. When the soldiers go to pull this tab to release the wax coating, it often breaks off. The men waste what could be precious seconds struggling with the box. Vesta thinks she has the solution. Why not use an adhesive cloth tape to seal the box? Something that would provide a waterproof seal but could be removed easily. Sometime in 1942 or early 1943, she mocks up the solution and takes it to her supervisors at Green River. They are not interested, but Vesta, she doesn't take no for an answer. No, sir. On February 10th, 1943, she takes the next logical step and writes directly to President Roosevelt, as you do. She appeals to the president's heart. I have two sons out there somewhere, one in the Pacific Islands, the other one with the Atlantic fleet. You have sons in the service also. We can't let them down by giving them a box of cartridges that takes a minute or more to open. The enemy taking their lives that could have been saved. FDR passes her letter on to the War Production Board. They are impressed and reply to Vesta in March, letting her know her idea has been approved. Pharmaceutical giant Johnson & Johnson soon produces the finished product. It's a cloth tape with one side covered with waterproof polyethylene and the other with a super strong adhesive. They call it duck tape because it's waterproof like a duck and because it's based on cotton duck duck fabric. The Army calls it Department of Utilities Cloth Tape, D-U-C, tape, right? Many soldiers refer to it as 100 mile an hour tape because its adhesive is so strong it can hold together a speeding Jeep. Looking ahead to the post-war construction boom, duct tape will help build the American dream. It is here that the name will morph into duct tape, duct tape, but it was in fact first duct tape. It's true, I didn't think so either, but it's true, it was duct tape first. See, the product will be mass marketed to the construction industry, and what will they find it most useful for? Holding together the joints in duct work for air conditioning and heating systems. Those soldiers and sailors that Vesta Stout is worrying about are probably doing their fighting fueled by another great wartime icon. I'm talking about spam. Like duct tape, it's not technically a wartime invention, but I'm fairly sure that without the war, most people outside the US would not have heard of it. It all started in 1937, which was still the Great Depression. Jay Hormel, head of Hormel Foods, came up with an idea to sell the otherwise unprofitable pork shoulder. He was inspired by the blocks of luncheon meat available in delis, and he decided to scale this down and can it. It came together in a recipe with just five ingredients, ground pork shoulder, water, salt, sugar, and sodium nitrate for coloring. These are mixed and heated and then vacuum sealed. And the name, well, that's apparently a shortened version of spiced ham and was the winning entry in a naming contest. I would really like to know what the losers were 
in the naming contest. Feel free to add your own name suggestions in the comments and the winner will get something worth having. Spam came to market in July 1937. A 1939 ad touted eggs and spam as the ideal breakfast a loving wife could make for her husband. For the kids, there's spam witches. For dinner, why not try a spam bake? According to Hormel, cold or hot, spam hits the spot. The new product faces some resistance over fears that canned meat is unsafe. Yet, by the outbreak of the war, it's a national success. And as the war goes global, so does spam. British and Soviet soldiers get their hands on it first in Lend-Lease shipments from 1941. Spam is perfect for military operations. It doesn't spoil. It can be eaten straight from the can or it can be fried. After the war, Nikita Khrushchev will claim, without spam, we would not have been able to feed our army. His love of spam is shared by British civilians. Living with food rationing, the arrival of spam and other American foodstuffs is a godsend. Frank Mee from Teesside in England encounters Spam for the first time in 1942. I decided it was the nicest thing I had tasted for a good while, and Mum then sliced it all up and fried it for our evening meal with potato and vegetables. It was a feast. The Spam became a prominent part of our diet. Fried, dipped in batter and deep fried, diced and put into stews and pies, or just plain cold in sandwiches with tomato and cucumber. American soldiers also begin relying on Spam as they are deployed around the world in 1942. They are less complimentary and come up with phrases like ham that didn't pass its physical, meatloaf without basic training, and the real reason war is hell. There are a few causes for this. First, compared with what they were eating before, many Americans see Spam as a step down while Brits see it as a step up. Second, much of the Spam served to US soldiers is not really spam, but rival products made of ground up pig ears, pig noses, and tongues. The soldiers do not know that though. To them, any canned pork is spam. Finally, the cooks serving spam don't always care how it turns out. One American soldier recalls it being burned as black as a painted door. Tens of thousands of hate letters will be sent to Jay Hormel, but in an interview, with the New Yorker towards the end of the war, Hormel will defend his creation. If they think Spam is terrible, they ought to have eaten the bully beef we had in the last war. He will certainly have the last laugh. Countries around the world will adopt Spam after the war. Uh, the British are probably the biggest fans, and in 2022, Spam will sit on the shelves of all of its major supermarkets. In Okinawa, Japan, Spam will form part of the regional dish Champuru. It's sort of an American-Japanese stir-fry. In the Philippines, Spam rice and eggs will be a common breakfast. And moving on from the Spam stir-fry, it's not just allied products that will stick around into the 21st century. When Hitler's forces blitzkrieged across Europe, part of their success was down to a cleverly designed metal can. See, in the late 1930s, all motorized armies faced the challenges of fuel supply. Yeah, you can have big tanker trucks or trains following the general horde, but the troops need a quick way to top up their own individual tanks. For this, they require a fuel container that's robust and can be poured and carried by hand. By 1937, the Germans have cracked it. Müller Engineering produces a metal container of 20 liter capacity. It has three handles, allowing one man to carry two empty cans in one hand. It has a spout with a snap top closure, making a funnel or an opener unnecessary. That cross-like pattern on the outside, that helps provide strength and allows the liquid inside some room to expand. Finally, the can is lined with a plastic, which allows it to be filled with either gasoline or water. The Germans call it the Wehrmacht Einheitskanister, or Wehrmacht Standard Canister. So this is a German invention. But in war, people don't really worry so much about a patent. And British and American fuel containers are all inferior to the Einheitskanister. The British four-gallon tanks made of tin are cheap to produce, but tend to spring a leak after just minor damage. And that is annoying if they're holding water, and it is downright dangerous if they're holding fuel. Things are so bad that they earn the nickname flimsies. Alan Moorhead in North Africa writes, we would put a couple petrol cans in the back of the truck. Two hours of bumping over the desert rocks usually produced a suspicious smell. Sure enough, we would find one or both of our cans had leaked and we had to go off hunting for more. 
Captured Einheit's canister, dubbed jerry cans by the British, of course, are used whenever possible. At the end of 1941, with the Allies victorious in Operation Crusader, a huge number of jerry cans are captured in North Africa. The men of the Long Range Desert Group are particularly fond of them. Their modified Chevys and Jeeps are fitted with jerry cans so they can roam for long distances behind enemy lines. Still, relying on captured cans won't cover requirements. And the Americans end up facing the same problem when they arrive in North Africa. So, a massive production program begins in the UK and the US. By early 1943, two million British produced jerry cans have been sent to North Africa. An invasion of Western Europe would need about 19 million jerry cans. The jerry can will soldier on after the war. It'll be adopted as a NATO standard. Charities and aid agencies will use them to deliver fresh water to those in need. Anyone working in motorsports or chemical engineering will take them for granted. Millions of people will use this piece of Third Reich technology every single day. So there we go. Some of the items that the realities of war will make household names. When the dark times are over, people will set about rebuilding. Japanese, Brits, Germans, and Americans may have been enemies, but one day they will share a love or hate for spam. Duct tape will save the lives of young Americans and ease the frustration of builders after the war and make many a sound engineer's life a lot smoother later in the century. And the jerry can, which helped the Wehrmacht crush Europe, will bring clean water to those in the world who need it the most. War is hell, but it can't help but bring some good things. If you'd like to know more about another special wartime invention, check out our video on the Higgins boat right here. And to get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com because that is what finances all of this fantastic programming. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.